Well, I got a text from a friend this week that said, oh boy, you're not going to like berate us as fathers on Father's Day, are you, in the sermon? And, uh, and I want to assure you I will not, any of us, um, but I have a passage that encourages us and challenges all of us in terms of what it means to pray. And so I'm going to pray the Lord's wisdom on us as we go through this passage that he will illuminate our minds and our hearts to receive from him. You know, it's a challenge when you, when you, when you study a passage. Um, one of the great challenges of it is that you want to share everything you've learned. And, and if you've taught anything, whether it's school or in church, Sunday school, anything like this, you know that you can't do that. You can probably only share somewhere 8 to 10% of what you've learned because we don't have all day to be here. But I will say I've gotten so excited about this passage from 2 Samuel 22. And if you have a Bible, go ahead and open there with me. If you didn't bring a Bible, take the uh, Bible from the pew rack in front of you. It's the New King James Version, which is what I'll be teaching from today. And, 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 and let's make sure we read it together or follow along together. But I got so excited about this passage that I've started having some ideas about maybe ho- doing like a church retreat or something where we go through and we just unpack this entire passage and really get into the, the meaning of it. You know, any communicator has a plan when they get up to speak. And um, as Christian pastors, we submit that to the Holy Spirit and, and we, we trust that our preparation has prepared us for the, for the hour and we, we plan to follow the theme. But At the same time, we yield uh, to what may be the leading of the Holy Spirit to go in a different direction. And so my my hope for you today is that when you go home, you can sit down with this passage and and not only understand it a little better, but that you'll be inspired to act upon it, that you'll be inspired and motivated, and, 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 and that is to prayer and spend time with the Lord. This is such a great passage. This is uh, 2 Samuel 22 is um, the basis for Psalm 18. Psalm 18 is tweaked just a little differently, and that, and that is because Psalm 18 is intended to be sung. This is rather poetic, although it is described as a song, it's, it's more poetic, and, and because of that, there's all this great um, treasure in it, especially when you, when you kind of explore Hebrew poetry um, which, which I did not like poetry in high school. I despise, anyone else despised poetry in high school? You know, the three of us that didn't like it, it was a, it was a huge challenge. The rest of you, what's wrong with you? Well, how did that happen? But Hebrew poetry, I like a little better. It's, a, it's, it's frankly, it's easier to understand. But in this, this, this incredible uh, poem, it, it helps us understand the nature and the character of God And it is my hope that as we understand that nature and character more, that we'll be more motivated to walk in relationship with him. You know, the theme of Father's Day is is something that, you know, we debate on whether we kind of go over the top with that or just, or do what we've done and try to honor and esteem the fathers. But this passage is for men and women. It's written for all of us. And let's turn our attention now to 2 Samuel 22. Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Now, right there is something interesting. From all of his enemies, he was delivered and from the hand of Saul. More than likely, this was distinguished because we wanted to to have the understanding that, that David always respected Saul. Saul was the king before David. Saul had an agenda to, to kind of destroy David, didn't like David. Um, and, and, and yet David never resisted Saul in a manner that he would take the issue into his own hands. Instead, he respected the position that Saul had. He respected that God would take care of Saul in his own way and that he himself wouldn't take matters into his own hands to deal with um, a really a formidable foe. But in a matter of devotional sense, you know, we all have challenges. We all have struggles. We all have enemies. The reason we open up time for prayer is in, in our church is because we understand that, that, that God is emotional and we're emotional. And the issues and the challenges that we face in life, they affect us emotionally. 
We don't set our emotions at the door when we encounter the presence of God. Instead, we bring all of that in to the fold. We bring that into the mix. The reason that hour is so important is because we have many needs here. I mean, I guess you're a lot like me in that you spend a lot of your time during the week dealing with the challenges of life. We have challenges. Some of them are, you know, can be described in all those enemies, all those problems, all those issues that we struggle with. But, but have you ever noticed in your life there's always that one big one? There's that one challenge that just never goes away or seemingly never goes away. You've got that one challenge that just sort of outshines the rest. That, this was the case for David. He had one enemy that wasn't really a big deal, but um, his name was Nabal, which you're going to find out that Nabal was basically a very foolish person. And I think it's his, his parents' fault that they named him Nabal. That would present, wow, you are awake and alive. Good. It's challenging when your name is Nabal. Especially when that kind of means foolish. You're kind of a problem. Well, Nabal had received some assistance from David and his mighty men. They had provided some protection for him. And, and kind of was the matter of the custom of the day was that you had to pay for those services. Now, as I was reading some comments on this, I thought, That's, that sounds a lot like the mafia or something. You know, like gangs or something. This is just kind of bizarre. But um, they kind of go over the top to explain to you it's not the same culture. Anyhow, David sends for some kind of payment for the services that he rendered. And um, Nabal responds like, well, who's David and much less who are you? Probably not a good move. And so his wife, Nabal's wife, gathers together sort of a care package. She puts some food together and she goes out to David and his mighty man. And she's like, um, my husband's really kind of a fool. And I'm really sorry for his behavior. Here's some food. Well, you know, David could have used his power, his authority. Uh, he could have used the economy of the day to demand payment. But instead, he just trusted in the Lord. And his, Nabal's wife goes home, and, and, and Nabal, strangely, kind of falls into what's kind of like a coma. And about 10 days, 10 days later, he's dead. David never raised his pinky. You know, David trusted in the Lord. You know, who are those people in your life that just kind of drive you crazy? Who are those people that have made very foolish decisions and they've hurt you? Who are those people in your lives that owe you something? You've got all kinds of vehicles and mechanisms and tools of manipulation and, you know, legal ways to deal with stuff, but you know, you ought to wait on the Lord and maybe the Lord would just take care of them himself, deal with them the way that he wants to. You know, uh, don't start praying, though, for those foolish people in your lives to go into comas and die. <laughs> but David just trusted in the Lord. He had plenty of other enemies that could fall into that classification of all his enemies. But then there was Saul. Wow. Wow. Saul had David on the run. I mean, Saul was such a huge enemy of David that David just had to be aware at all times. And yet, when David had an opportunity to deal with Saul in the flesh the way that any other man probably would have wanted to, you remember they were in, Saul went into a cave to go to sleep and David happened to be in there and could have easily taken Saul's life. But he didn't. He trusted in the Lord. You know, the Lord allowed David to deal with all of these foes for some amount of time. But he trusted in the Lord. And on this day that he was delivered from all the enemies and from the hand of Saul, he said, verse 2b, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. 
I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Here David lists eight uh, character traits about the Lord. And each one of them would be so much fun to go into. You know, I mean, God's my rock, meaning he's my sure foundation. God is the horn of my salvation. This was an offensive tool to agitate and provoke and to take care offensively the enemy. And David understood the nature and character of God to be all of that and more. And because of that confidence that he had in the Lord, he says, the Lord is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. David's confidence in the Lord is probably why he sought the Lord. His confidence in the nature and character of God produced in him a heart of prayer, a heart of worship. And I'm going to read for you now, and and, and maybe somewhat over the top demonstratively, because I want to illustrate the point that when you pray, when you spend time with God, God is not just a passive rock. but that God is emotionally stirred by us. And David gives us here a metaphor of how God responds to you and me when we pray. And the reason it's important to see this is because I think if you and I will go to prayer with this in mind, that God is aroused by us in prayer, that he is stirred to even anger on our behalf, then maybe our confidence in the Lord will increase. You know, men, we have the impossible job. I think in the 21st century, I think to be a man or a woman, just both uh, being a father or a mother, it's just impossible. The expectations are incredibly high. And with the marketing system we have now, you know, everybody has to be, has to, you know, to be successful in some way. You have to brand yourself and you have to be marketable now. I mean, it is is difficult. Our young people, they're feeling it. They're dealing with it. They're talking about the pressure of it. You know, one of the challenges that I face in my office as a pastor, I deal with a lot of couples and a lot of men, and, and, and and I am a man, is just the pressure on every front of life to have to be successful to be successful as a father, a breadwinner, successful in works, so be, be creative, to be wanted, to be needed, to be in high demand. And then, and then there's the whole idea of, you know, being a community servant. And it's just, it's just a lot of pressure. And there's only so many hours in the day. And most men that I know feel like failures. Most men that I deal with on a regular basis Feel the pressure of life. And one of the pressures that godly men face is to be a spiritual leader. And a lot of times, well meaning voices put pressure on that man to be a spiritual giant and to pray more and to to lead more and to teach the Bible to the family more. There's just a lot of pressure. But you know, as if men want to get to know each other, it takes a lot of skill and discipline for men to sit down over a cup of coffee and deal face to face. Colonel Patterson and I, we meet a couple of times a month and we have extended conversation and we've developed through years, him a little bit more, a few more years than me, have developed the years of learning how to communicate face to face. But you know, that is a, an acquired skill for men. Men best develop relationships while doing something whether that's hunting or bowling or just simply, my favorite, getting in the car and both staring out the windshield and driving. There's so much great, there's just a lot of great conversation that can take place in that. And so when we bring up the subject of men in prayer, it's challenging. And when men feel pressure to pray, it can almost shut a a man down. And so, men, I want to encourage you today as we look at this passage that David is praying while living. 
David is praying while under pressure. David is seeking God in the midst of chaos. He's crying out to God. And I want you to see how he describes God's response to us. In verse five, follow along with me. When the waves of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid and the sorrows of Sheol surrounded me and the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried out to my God and he heard my voice from his temple. My cry entered his ears. See, David, rather than try to fix his own problems, David, rather than try to manipulate his way through, David understands that he is in trouble and he cries out to God and he believes that God hears his voice. Men and women, when you pray, God hears you. I know you've been given an obscure passage or two that talks about how God doesn't listen, but let me tell you something. God hears you when you pray. He's a good and faithful God. And he hears you when you pray. And God responds, verse 8, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. God is angry, not at David, but because David is in distress. God is angry, yes, he is, but not at you, but because of what has happened to us as his people. And smoke went up from his nostrils. This is an incredible picture of God. And a devouring fire from his mouth, coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and he came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled and the Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. This idea of uttering his voice, I had to figure out what that meant. I wasn't sure. It turns out that to utter, it means an almost involuntary scream. Imagine when you were a kid and you were playing hide and go seek or something and someone jumped out and yelled, boo. Your response was to utter, whoa. You didn't intentionally think, oh, scary moment now, scream. And God is so moved here that he's breathing passionately. He's gotten up from his high and holy throne and he is on the move towards David because he's angry. He's angry because David is in distress. And he's so angry that he screams involuntarily. He's aroused emotionally. He sent out arrows and scattered them. Now he's throwing a godly, holy fit. Lightning bolts, he vanquished them. Now watch this, verse 16. And the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. The metaphor here is to show us that God is so emotionally angry about this that he's breathing with such intensity that even at the blast of the breath of his nostrils, the water is forced out of the Earth and makes the sea laid bare. Boy, that's some intense emotion. And remember, this is emotion of anger, not at David, but because of what David was going through. David cried out in distress, and the Lord heard his cry. In verse 17, He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. The admission here that David displays of that, you know what, these enemies, they're too strong. Not despite the fact that I'm a king, too strong. Despite the fact of my great wealth, the enemies I'm facing are too big. Despite having everything that he needed to succeed in life, there were some things that were just too big. 
And as men who we're just faced with that challenge of believing we have to fix everything, moms, these days you feel the same pressure, women, to fix everything, to be all things. Listen, there are some things, men and women, that are just too big for us. And the sooner we come to that place of humility, as soon as we come to that place of quit trying to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and surrender in prayer and cry out to God, the sooner our deliverance is on the way. They confronted me, verse 19, in the day of my calamity. He's saying as though I was already down and here they come. But the Lord was my support. And watch this. He also brought me into a broad place. The Lord delivered me because he delighted in me. You know, there's something about life when it's just, when the pressure's hot, It's been a long battle. We've been under pressure a long time. It's almost as though you feel like you're walking on eggshells or maybe you're walking on a tightrope. Imagine in David's mind as he's, 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 he's walked these trails through, through the barren desert and it's dangerous. You get off course, you're in trouble. You know, I have a friend, he's an accountability brother of mine and, and, and sometimes we'll just text each other or just call each other and, and, and let me just put a disclaimer. I'm going to get a little bit transparent today. And it's not because I'm, I'm about to crack up or anything. It's just that, you know, if we can't confess sin to one another, if we can't confess the struggle to one another, then, then we can't pray for one another and be healed, you know. So I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get out there just a little bit, but I don't want you to get overtly worried about me. I'm not trying to, to get that kind of attention, but this accountability partner and I, sometimes we just text each other and say 30 seconds. And what that means is that we understand because of our relationship, we've had lots of conversation to say that, you know what, a man is only 30 seconds away from destroying his life. A man and a woman, we're only 30 seconds away from making decisions that ruin our families. All it takes is veering off the course just for a moment and you will destroy lives. It's a lot of pressure. And because we haven't always known how to deal with the issues and the challenges and the emotional deficiencies of life, we're tempted to fall into a pit so quickly. 30 seconds. And when you spend your life day after day, week after week, and you are 30 seconds away from sin, from destroying everything, it can take its toll on a person. It's hard. 30 seconds. David, after a long season, living on the run, hiding cave to cave, despite all his wealth, despite his mighty men, despite all that he had going for him, man, he was exhausted. And in his distress, he cried out to the Lord. And he says, the Lord delivered him and put him in a spacious place. The picture I got while studying this is thinking about a place that our kids would go ride bikes sometimes. And and you're on these trails and and it's all wooded. But then you kind of break out of the woods and you just come into that huge meadow. And it's just instinctive, man. As soon as you hit that, that meadow, you just start pedaling faster. Because you're free, you know, you get to just kind of just go for it because you're not having to worry about the, the trails and who's coming around the other side because it's a broad, spacious place. Oh, that the Lord will deliver us as he promises and put us in a spacious place, a place of a kind of an, a, a, a peace, a, pl- a place where we're not worried about that 30 seconds because everything is just great says here they delivered me because he delighted in me. 
I won't go into this, but at the very core of this incredible poem, it explains that beyond these verses that we're reading today, it explains why God delighted in David, why God liked David. You know, we're raised, thankfully, most of us in a culture that teaches us that God loves us. And, and one time while I was trying to witness uh, to a girl that I worked with at a law firm, I, 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 I pulled out the trump card, the one that I just knew would get her to fall on her knees and repent and cry out, Jesus, save me. And I said, Jackie, Jesus loves you with the best Christian grin I could give. And she looked right at me and she said, I'm not impressed because Jesus loves everybody. Trump card didn't work. But you know what? I understood something there that day. And one of the great joys of following Christ is that every day I'm be believing more and more and accepting more and more that not only does he love me, but he likes me. He likes you. One of the great privileges of being a father, an earthly father, a sinful father, is that I have a better perspective on love than I ever had before I was a father. You know, when I look at my kids, even when I'm about ready to whoop their tail, I love them, but I like them too. I love everything about my children. I love the way they look, I love the way their, their eyebrows are shaped. I love the hair on their head. My son, you know, I just, I look at him and I just think, man, I wish everybody could have a boy like this one. I look at my little girl and I'm like, I've got the most awesome little lady ever. Our heavenly father looks at us. You know, scripture teaches us that he knows how many hairs are on our head. How could he know how many hairs on our head if he's not just in love with us and likes us and is counting those hairs on our head? God is not some distant, angry, mean ogre out ready to get you. Matter of fact, while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died on the cross to redeem us, to make us holy. a good and gracious God. And when he gets emotionally aroused, he responds to us to deliver us. He likes us. The reason God delighted in David is because, as the song goes on to say, is because David kept the law. Well, now, if you've done any Bible study at all, you know that David, we know for a fact he broke the law. A lot. But David had, in striving to keep that law in that system, faith in God. And David had, when he cried out in distress to the Lord, faith. And the way you and I please God the Father, the way that you and I bring him great pleasure is to believe in him, to trust in him, to have faith in him. David trusted in the Lord with the truth of the law. At the very anchor of the law is the great Shema, to love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Love. And love in those days was characterized by obedience. And so he strived to obey. And when he would understand and that, that he had sinned, he was quick to repent. And in the light of the cross of Jesus Christ, we look upon the person and the work of Jesus and we trust in him, we believe in him, and we are saved. That is faith. It is impossible without faith to please God. Therefore, with faith, you please God. And God finds great delight, great delight and having a relationship with his people because we respond to him in faith.
What are your challenges? What are your anxieties? What is it that you have tried over and over and over and you can't beat, including the big one? One of the great privileges of of getting to preach and teach is that you're in the scripture way before everyone else and you have to, you have to wrestle with all these issues yourself. And, and this week, I began to realize that, you know what, I have those enemies that kind of belong in all, the all camp, but then I have that big one. And I have that big one and I, and I wrestled this week with the realization that, that I, I, I'm so tired of, of, of trying to figure out how to fix this issue that, that I, I've, quit, I've, I've, I've quit trying, basically. Because I'm exhausted with it. And, and, and I I'm not even talking to the Lord about it anymore because I'm kind of just over it. Just feel defeated. And that is the number one way that I think we hide from the big issues in our lives, or a lot of us, is that we just give up. And this week, as a result of being in this passage and trying to wrestle with the nature and character of God to believe and trust again that God is not angry at me, but he's, he's angry because of the mess we're in, and that if we'll only have faith in him and cry out to him, he will respond, I realized that the Lord was beckoning me to bring that big issue back in front of him again. I think there's things that you and I need to put at the feet of Jesus. I think there's challenges that we face emotionally. There's challenges we face financially. There's challenges that we face relationally that we just need to come in faith before the Lord and put them at his feet and to accept that our enemies, they are too strong for us. I was in a seminary course, and one of the requirements of the course was to go to an AA meeting. It was incredible. If you've never been to an AA meeting, go. There's one every day, like all day, morning, noon, and night. And find an open meeting and go in there sometime. Just go by yourself. Don't make it a field trip. That would be weird. But go by yourself and go sit in a group and experience what it's like to be with people who have come to a place of such honesty that they just lay it on the line, admitting that they're powerless over this, this, this evil, this, this habit, this addiction, this disease, this whatever in their lives. It will teach you how to take that step if you're not there yet to be so honest and so real. And and by the way, you can go to an open meeting and you don't have to say your name. You don't have to tell anyone why you're there. And, and, And you will leave there impacted. Let's stand. You and I have such a great treasure in the word of God that can teach us about this nature and character of God. And I pray that faith rises in your heart to believe that whether you're driving down the road, staring through a windshield, talking to Jesus, or whether you sit down in a formal time with a devotional book and a journal and a cup of coffee to have face-to-face time with Jesus, My prayer is that we, as a family of God, would have such faith in a God who is so holy, but because of the blood of Christ has brought us into such close relationship that he responds to us in prayer. The best prayer, men and women, is honest prayer not articulate prayer but honest prayer and Hannah taught us sometimes prayer doesn't even have words just such hurt 
but that heart directed at the Lord. Would you just do something? Just lift your hands or kneel or raise your hands. Just do something. Just assume a different posture and as we direct our hearts, our prayer towards the Lord. Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus. That you would allow such faith to rise up in our hearts to see you as a God who hears us and responds to us. And Father, I pray for the men of this congregation that you would infuse them with such faith, hope, life, that they would have such freedom to admit their weakness to admit their frailty, to be humble before you. Father, I pray for the women who have had to manage and carry so many different roles that they're exhausted and tired. That God, that you would just hear the cry of their hearts, those being expressed with words and those just being expressed to you in some way. Father, a lot of us stand here today in the need of a miracle. Some of us feel as though we're about to drown. Some of us feel as though we're about to suffocate like David. Lord, I pray for those who need deliverance, need freedom, need hope, need life, need joy, need a breakthrough that, God, you would deliver us and put us in a broad and spacious place. so that we can just revel in your glory and revel in your joy, revel in your peace and revel in who you are and where we've been struggling, trying to white knuckle and fix everything ourselves. Lord, instead, Lord, we turn to you now in prayer. We turn to you now asking you, God, to do what for us is impossible, but to you all things are possible. And we ask this in the precious and in the powerful name, the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen. For dismissal, here's what I have for you. Take home, think about, guarding your heart. Jesus knows all about our struggles, and He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend, not a friend, not a friend, not a friend, not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, 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 no. Not one. And you're taking him with you, and that's why you can go in peace to serve the Lord. Amen.